the world is changing fast. New technologies are impacting how we think about products, services, and the way we live our lives. Nowhere is this trend more present than in financial services, where new business models and customer expectations are changing our conceptions about banking, finance, and the very nature of money. Welcome to ReBank, a visionary podcast about banking, fintech, and the future. The future of banking is here. Hello and welcome to ReBank. I'm your host, Will Beeson. In this special episode, we're joined by Lex Sokolin for analysis of a few important recent fintech developments. Lex is the author of the Future of Finance newsletter, the CMO and global fintech co-head at Consensus, and a genuinely next-level thinker. In this conversation, Lex and I examine the recent SoFi acquisition of Galileo, Movin's decision to close its B2C digital bank, and what, if any impact, the fintech product developments we've seen in response to COVID-19 will have on the future of financial innovation. For all of our past episodes, and to sign up to our newsletter, please visit bankingthefuture.com. Thank you very much for joining us today. Please welcome Lex Sokolin. Lex Sokolin, welcome to ReBank. Great to be back. Well, it felt like taking advantage of remoteness to connect, to, to run through uh, a, a few of the most interesting topics that we're both looking at right now made sense. Uh, as everyone listening will know by now, I'm a huge fan of the newsletters that you put out, the weekly free one on Monday, the, the subscription one that comes out later in the week with Deeper Dive Analysis, fantastic. Everyone should check it out. There are a few points that you touched on in there, which I think are worth picking up. The, the first, which is, um, is, I think, a particular relevance to the entire fintech industry, consumer fintech industry, SoFi buying Galileo. So $1.2 billion, SoFi aggregated consumer fintech bundle uh, came from a place of lending, buying Galileo, a payment processor and program manager for effectively neobank and bank-like products. What's your take on that one? It's a really weird one. Um, you would think that the sort of M and A landscape, uh, sort of the M and M and A landscape, is entering this twilight zone um, while we're in quarantine and we don't know what the uh, what the economy looks like in three to four months. But um, it's a weird one for a number of reasons. Um, the first is SoFi is. You know, if I were to think about brands, neobank or robo-advisor brands that can persist and actually build an independent business, I think about SoFi. And if I think about their cash flow, what they do to actually make money, I think about student lending. And um, they've added on adjacent businesses, whether it's digital wealth management or free investing uh, and trading uh, or crypto trading. And so they've kind of expanded the footprint for their B2C play. With um, this acquisition, they're going a little bit down and sideways. So they are acquiring somebody who provides services to them uh, in terms of prepaid cards and things of that nature. Um, but then they're also buying somebody who provides services to all of their competitors. Think about Chime and Robinhood and other large fintech names. And so it's it's confusing to me because either you are, you know, trying to take this uh, strategic asset so that your your potential uh, competitors aren't as successful, but then they also are paying you, I think, something like a hundred million in revenue, so you can't undermine that. Uh, second, I think it's it's um, it's very telling that SoFi is going sideways into the the B two B business which implies maybe that you can't squeeze out enough juice out of the, uh, out of the lemon uh, for B2C consumer, which um, also you know, is, is sort of a dangerous messaging to, uh, to the other consumer plays. Um, and then finally, you know, the 1.2 billion sounds like a really big number, um, but it's only 75 million, which is in cash. The rest is in equity and debt. And, um, that cash amount, the seventy-five million, is basically what uh, what Galileo raised last year. 
So it's giving the cash back to the VCs, getting some SoFi equity in return, um, and then creating this sort of really uh, interesting competitive situation. So I, I think you touched on a, a handful of interesting points there. I, I think broadly speaking, I would have a different take, um, w- which is that a consumer fintech banking, banking with a lowercase b and in quotation marks because SoFi isn't a bank, uh, just despite the fact that they at one point, I think under Cagney pursued a banking license for a short period of time and eventually withdrew the application. Uh, it's it's effectively, I mean, it's the same model, more or less, as a Chime, a Varo, until Varo launches as a bank, uh, a move-in, which uh, we'll actually touch on later recently, shut its doors. It, it's it's effectively this, this neo-banking model, like you're building on regulated infrastructure. Usually, it's a combination of a bank charter uh, or something similar, and a, a an API layer. And often those two pieces come from different places. Like the the chartered bank is not also the modern software company that's providing account opening as an API and payments as, as an API and KYC as an API. They're kind of like two components there. One being the bank charter holder, which provides the balance sheet and the regulatory cover, and one being like the, the software provider. And Galileo is the software provider in a lot of these neo banking stacks. So you, you talked about some of their clients, the Chimes, the Robin Hoods, um, I, I think Varo, I think you mentioned Monzo. So it's it, it's effectively the the connectivity between the traditional sponsor banking infrastructure and the fintechs. And like with any intermediary platform layer, part of your margin as the the brand on the front, SoFi in this case, gets siphoned off through the software company. And they're obviously marking you up because they're trying to run a business. The neobanking space, I, I think the one takeaway, and this is I think this is clear to anyone who's operating in this space, but also probably to most commentators looking at it from the outside, is that at the end of the day, it's a very low margin business. Like everyone's striving for scale you know, first 5 million customers, 10 million customers, 20 million customers, because at the end of the day, offering banking for free and earning uh, a clip of the ticket on interchange and some float on deposits works at scale, but it's not not a high margin business. So once you get to that scale, how do you expand your margin? Well, you do that by reducing your costs. And one great way to do that is by owning the infrastructure uh, that sits underneath you. So I, I think that has to be part of it from SoFi standpoint. The, the interesting piece here is that not only are they expanding their own margins by owning that software layer, but they're actually participating in the margins of all their competitors and the rest of the industry, which, um, yeah, I, I guess we can see how long that lasts. I don't know how I would be feeling about things if I were Chime right now, effectively consuming core services from one of my competitors. But at the end of the day, the banking industry kind of works this way. Like, you know, there's certain, you know, card processing companies that grew out of, you know, large incumbents that have kind of become industry standards. It's, it's kind of an incestuous industry in, in that way. Um, so, so definitely part of it has to be, has to be margin. I think the other piece, if you step back and really examine this neobank model, I mean, really, like if you start from the standpoint of traditional banking, what are the revenue lines? It's net interest margin through balance sheet. So it's deposits on one side, lending on the other side. And that's captured in the neobank model as either float on deposits or to a very limited extent so far, margin on lending. SoFi is one of the very few, you know, quote unquote, neobanks that offers lending as a core part of its proposition. And the second revenue driver is fee income. And that's translated uh, generally in the neobanking model as as interchange. They're effectively subsidizing free banking, like not charging fees, by taking a higher clip of every transaction thanks to this Durban Amendment. And where the industry has to go, because again, back to the point of low marginality, the industry has to go to a place where the the full stack consumer 
digital bank, consumer neo bank, has both a an interchange component and a you know, pseudo balance sheet component. And just getting paid a share of interest on deposits, i.e. your float, is I think not sustainable to, to really drive like a, a long-term, profitable, sustainable consumer fintech business. Lending has to be a core part of that. And I think that this play for SoFi creates a fantastic distribution opportunity for them into the neobank community via Galileo uh, distribution of, of lending products. So if you look around the market at the leaders, current leaders in the banking as a service space, the, the bank corps, the cambers, the synapses, uh, a number of, of individual banks, BBVA with its open platform, no one offers lending or credit cards out of the box. And I think it's a huge gap in the space right now. And it's a gap that has to be filled over time. And I think SoFi is now in a unique position to leverage its experience in lending to, to be the first to really fill that space. And I think even if they're competitive considerations with the likes of Chime and Monzo and Varo and whoever it is, the ability to offer lending as an API and fundamentally change the economics of those businesses is hugely powerful. So I think this is really interesting and it's going to be fascinating to watch. Yeah, lots of, lots of um, strong points. I, I, I do take a very, I think I take a more conspiratorial take on this. Um, you know, in the narrative that you've provided, uh, I still don't see a reason why this thing should sit inside of SoFi. Like, yeah, it's good for SoFi to buy a good business, um, but why is it good for the good business? Um, you know, I th like the Plaid transaction, which is aggregation and open banking without the payments product um, yet built in. And here we have the aggregation with the payments product built in just on a smaller footprint, um, you know, at a billion versus the five billion. Uh, why doesn't MasterCard buy Galileo? To me, that's a much stronger sort of industrial logic than SoFi saying, Oh, we now we're now going horizontal because that's you know that's additional margin for us. Unless the B two C thing is not working, and then you know so then you say okay the B two C thing's not really working. Maybe all those you know let's play the game. Um, the uh, favorite stat of the week: uh, Mortgage Banking Association did a survey of forbearances of mortgages, uh, and. Uh, forbearance, which is, hey, can I please not pay this month, went from 0.2% to 2.5%. Uh, so grew 1,000% uh, because, um, because of the quarantine, coronavirus, the unemployment numbers. So maybe if you're sitting on a whole bunch of debt from students who um, uh, are graduating business school and are super excited to be associates at investment bank uh, at investment banks and pay down those student loans. All of a sudden, you're sitting on top of loans that are likely to be defaulted and non-performant very, very soon. Um, and that is your primary cash flow engine to finance all the other adventures you have, which are still non-economic. Um, so, you know, if, if that's the case and your B2C thing's not working, yeah, let's use our brand and equity and try to create a deal where we go horizontal. And we're, you know, the only thing we're paying to acquire this thing is giving the cash back to the prior round from four months ago. Like it's, it's not, it, it, there, there's not this kind of existential risk and we can spin it as a comp to the Plaid transaction. Um, and then from the point of view of Galileo, which is purportedly generating, you know, a hundred million in revenue and you're being bought at 1.2 billion, which is 10 to 15 X, a nice FinTech valuation. Um, you're not really cashing out again, given the economics, but you mentioned my favorite company, which is Bancorp. So Galileo is the glue between Bancorp and all these other things. It sits on top of Bancorp. Those are all where the, the prepaid cards come. And Bancorp in the last month um, had its price drop by 
54% from something like 600 million public market cap to 300 million market cap. So to me, this stuff is like massively out of alignment. Um, and even though the Lego pieces can be made to stick together, uh, I think there's more going on under the hood. Well, I, I think the one piece I would agree with you on is that the valuation made made this deal. You know, like I, I don't see this having happened at 1.2 billion in cash or uh, or, or, at a, or at a plaid valuation, you know, like effectively paying back VCs from the, the 2019 round at, at a valuation, which is largely in line and doing the rest with equity. Like, why not? I, I think there's enough here that, um, that, that the deal makes a lot of sense for SoFi. Absolutely. I'm interested to see if, uh, if going forward, they revisit the banking license uh, concept. We saw the lending club acquisition of, of Radius Bank uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, Varo has now been approved, it sounds like, by all uh, necessary regulators to, um, to, to start operating as the first digital-only fully chartered bank. The the one piece that I think in the in the you know quote unquote SoFi stack now that's that's missing from a a, a long term watertight viability standpoint is the is the banking license which which truly unlocks the the balance sheet in the in the sense of um, cheap deposits. We'll see where they go. So the other piece that I wanted to to make sure we we picked up on and I have a hunch that perhaps they're related news items uh, or, or at least there are parallels in your mind uh, I, I think in in mine perhaps uh, they're not the the move in uh, announcement uh, I think it was just this week that they're going to shut down the b2c offering so move in maybe the or one of the along with simple first ever app only digital banks in the US basically shuttering its B2C business because you know over the past few years the B2B operation selling their technology white label to to banks including I think TD Bank in Canada uh, maybe a bank or two in uh, in the US maybe in Australia I think that B2B business has grown to be something like 90% of their revenues and they in short decided that the B2C business was no longer sustainable What's your reaction to that? Yeah, so I had a, um, a Twitter robot uh, retweet a American Banker article, which had a little bit of a clickbait article uh, headline uh, saying, you know, um, move in, sh- shutting down his business. Um, and uh, Brett King uh, personally correcting um, my, my Twitter robot on that mistake, um, that in fact, it is not shutting down move in, um, but rather that you know, the, they're going down the enabler route rather than the B2C route. Uh, I would say it's it's almost non-news. It's um, not surprising to me at all. I think um, uh, two elements. The first is there was a lot of pioneering work done in the beginning of the 2010s uh, when the things that we're talking about now, they just didn't have a name. They didn't have a mental model or a concept that people jump to. So things like neobanks or robo-advisors, um, people didn't know exactly how these vectors were going to play out. And I think um, Brett did a very heavy lift um, in educating, conceptualizing, and building out um, ideas uh, and software and interfaces that a lot of people used as inspiration for what they did. The second thing is um, there's just a lot of B2C competition that came up in multiple dimensions. The first is not only is it competitive and low margin, but your barrier to entry in terms of the venture checks you have to raise for B2C and that marketing machine are in the order of magnitude of 50, 100, 250 million uh, dollars and often to burn that every six months. And so um, I I think that's a... that's a different magic power from necessarily like designing and, and ideating the thing. And the very strong teams that who are good at raising money and um, creating that viral, or at least creating that customer acquisition machine, um, you know, because Movin's name was never in the same list as N26, Revolut, 
Monzo and the other core neobanks, you know, it was, it was clear that they weren't, and in the U.S., Chime, Moneyline, and others, it was clear that um, you know they weren't garnering the millions of users that you would need, um, and the hundreds of millions of venture that you would need to actually create that machine. Not that it's a good machine, but that's just that's just what it is. And I think the the B two B play is um, is in some ways a more thoughtful one. It's it requires a, a more nuanced and uh, tactical uh, approach. Uh, and I think again they were they were early in um, getting a partnership with financial institutions and knowing how to talk to financial institutions. And so I think of you know eleven FS in the UK as um, sort of a in some ways a comparison of um, really focusing on telling the story for for incumbents. Um, so I wouldn't say, you know, I, I don't think it's necessarily a surprise that this has happened. Um, the, I guess the, the last piece I want to mention is that the, it took a while for the value proposition of neobanks to become apparent in the U S whereas in Europe, um, the value proposition across, uh, international money movement was much clearer, much quicker, and I think enabled companies uh, like TransferWise and Revolut to stand up much faster rather than just saying, hey, here's a cool user experience. Um, so I think those, all those different pieces combine into the outcome that we see, but um, you know, I, I wouldn't overinterpret it. I guess um, the, well, firstly, Brett is a friend of the the podcast and you know, certainly wish wish him and move in all the best i'm sure on the on the b2b side business will continue to to boom not least in this world in which um <laughs> i don't know about you lex but t- to me uh if the idea of walking into a physical bank branch was a turnoff uh pre coronavirus um the idea of walking into a physical bank branch now and uh swapping miasma with a bunch of strangers uh, is is even less appealing than it was previously so i'm i'm sure the the b2b business that uh move in continues to to run will be will be hugely valuable and, and i think you know that extends to a lot of fintech and we're seeing a lot of comments to that point actually there there's there is probably a really interesting exchange we had on on this topic which maybe we can uh, here in a second about fintechs using this current pandemic as an opportunity to display new product uh, functionality. But but before we do that, I thought there was a fantastically savvy move. It sounded like Colin Walsh, so another another friend of Rebank uh, who runs Varo, founder and CEO of Varo, from what I can tell, probably read the move in uh, news when it when it came out and um, realized what that potentially meant for them, reached out to, to Brett and quickly did did a deal. So I think Varo is looking to basically onboard uh, Movin's B2C customer base, which in an era of $300 to $350 plus customer acquisition for, for new checking accounts um, and a huge preponderance of users that, you know, put 20 bucks or 50 bucks into a, uh, a digital bank and, and never really do much that drives revenue to the provider. Uh, I think being able to onboard a critical mass of self-declared digital banking diehards, like people that have been with, with move for some period of time is, is, is an extremely savvy play. Definitely agree with that. I think we're in a moment where, um, if you have cash flow and you're able to hire talent or acquire, um, if you've got the the ability to withstand the current situation and take some risky bets, uh, it's going to certainly pay dividends. So then to to wrap up, let's let's pick up that last point, the one about this current uh, pandemic being a fantastic opportunity for fintechs to 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 really step up and and show why it can be beneficial to have an agile software-based business model uh, in in the face of a of a quickly changing world i think plaid put out something interesting recently i think using um, business bank transaction history to quickly approve businesses for paycheck protection loans from the sba which we're watching incumbent banks struggle to deliver basically the the ability even of a of a massive massive bank uh you know chase or bank of america 
they're they're just not able to scale their SME lending operations quickly enough to to, to even deploy effectively free cash, uh, government backed you know, taxpayer money to to prop up the the SME segment. They're not able to do it, and fintechs have stepped in with some very interesting solutions to genuinely address elements of this crisis. Plaid comes to mind for me. Any Anything that you've seen? This is definitely in the silver lining uh, category. You know, I, I think um, it, we're all in a really difficult situation and it's hard to find the right thing to say or to do. Uh, how much of it is theater of people trying to force their solution into something that's not necessary versus how much of it is real. You know, I think it's it's just a really ambiguous time. Um, what we do know uh, is that the massive demand sh- uh, shock is breaking a whole bunch of things. And so if you look across macroeconomic charts, I mean, it's, it's almost um, comical how they look where any chart you touch is, uh, you know, wiggling in a straight line just a little bit like plus five, minus three, plus 10, minus seven, plus two, minus one, and then it's like minus 500,000. Um, and that's every chart you touch, whether it's the unemployment numbers or whether it's uh, mutual fund outflows or whether it's uh, mortgage forbearance. I mean, all, all these numbers are just sharp breaks. And the pieces where things really um, fall apart are around, you know, they're, they're kind of sequential. So it starts with people and, and their work and unemployment. And so concepts around um, giving getting money to people uh, and today, I think it's like this bailout concept, but broader is universal basic income. Uh, and uh, there are a number of companies that are talking about being more efficient about getting that money to people because they can't wait a month. Um, they can't wait a month to get that check. They need it now because most people are living in a really constrained environment. And so I know that Chime started to um, uh, offer adva- like $1,200 advances to people across their user base i think a number yeah so this is the personal checks that people are expected to to receive under the cares act and it's yeah. basically making that available immediately yeah and they're you know they're they're taking the credit risk um i think a number of the money movement companies square venmo type um have all stepped forward and said you know how can we help um in on the crypto side on the blockchain side a number of projects um are working with um, like regional entities, government entities in Europe, at least that I'm aware of, um, to build out ways to connect identity with uh, delivering payments, um, and that connects into the concept of central bank digital currency because you know maybe it's the Fed that's bailing you out. It's not um, you know Bank of America. Maybe it's going direct, and you can see that starting to happen with the other problem, which is small businesses, right? So we've blown up all of our small businesses um, and they need relief because um, there, there is no consumer demand. Uh, and so they're going to get that relief in the form of forgivable loans or other bailouts. Uh, and so, you know, who administers that? How, how do small businesses raise money? So I think uh, there's opportunity for nimble players to figure out um, that piece next, SME support. And then right after is you start to get into you know mortgages and rent payments and smoothing that out, and it's almost like a wave. Once you once you get into those assets, you start getting into the rest of the financial assets, right? So who holds debt? Who holds um, real estate? What are the portfolios that hold it? What happens to um, the structure of um, of those investments as the underlying you know, spoils and goes bad? And so um, then you need data and transparency and mark to market and all these things. Um, so I think it is definitely an opportunity for, for companies to um, uh, try and maybe get clients, whereas before people would, would be too risk averse to trying a digital solution. Yeah. Well, I, I think that point about um, d- direct access from government sources, you know, t- treasury, whatever it is, to... Um, consumers to small businesses is is an interesting one and, and one that we should watch in, in fact this whole this whole piece around um, you know meaningful uh, reactions and innovations that are likely to 
be born now in this moment, uh, but kind of continue to to mature over time is probably probably a, a space that we should we should keep watching. Um, look, let's let's call it for today and uh, and try to pick this conversation up uh, at the next opportunity. Lex, great to connect. Uh, thank you very much for joining us today. My pleasure. Wash your hands, everybody. <laughs> Take care. Talk to you soon. Bye. Thanks for tuning into Rebank. If you like today's show, reach out. Follow us on Twitter at Rebank Podcast and join the conversation. For more on banking, fintech, and the future, check out our regular content at www.bankingthefuture.com.